On Saturday the 22nd of January at 9.30 in the morning, we will be gathering all together to pray. This is going to be for the whole church family. So whether you're young, old, um, a family, part of a family or a single, um, we want to start the year in the best way by praying all together. This morning uh, we'll be, it will start at 9.30 with pastries and tea and coffee and then we'll worship together um, and then we'll be able to pray for our world, the city, uh, the local community and um, the church family in lots of different creative um, and interactive ways using the whole building um, and there will also be a chance to walk and do a prayer walk around the local area so please come along we'd love to see you and then we've got our alpha course which has just started and um, this is running at St Mark's on Wednesday evening so um, there's still a chance for you to come along or visit uh, invite your friends and family um, who don't know Jesus so that's going to be on Wednesday evenings at 7.30 running every week for the next seven weeks so please be praying and inviting people um, to come along and then on Monday the 24th of January we've got a our prayer for Woodhouse um, so this is back in 2022 um, and this is uh, we've got a group of people who gather um, together in the local area about once a month um, to pray and ever since we've been um, led to St Mark's we've been um, we've known God uh, has called us to be a blessing to Woodhouse and to London and this is one of the best ways we can do that is to pray together um, so if, even if you don't live in the area um, or you're not part of the central cluster we'd love you to join us as we gather we meet in different people's homes locally, um, usually on a Monday evening. There's a WhatsApp group where we share news and prayer point, points. If you'd like to get involved, please message David Cole on david.cole at gatewayleads.net. Um, yeah, and today we've got Sam uh, speaking to us again and he's going to continue from his sermon last week. Um, all about the church in the New Testament. So here's Sam. Hello Gateway Church. It's great to be able to speak to you again. Welcome. We're going to be continuing to look and uh, think a little bit about uh, biblical church life today and you might be listening in life groups and this is going to work really really well for you or you might be listening um, individually or catching up because you weren't for some reason able to make life group this week. Um, it's going to be a little bit different but I'd encourage you to have a bible if you can at all. Well let me just set the scene a little bit you might be wondering why I'm speaking from home rather than at St Mark's as normal. I'll come to that in a moment. But last week I spoke from Hebrews 12 reflecting back on the big picture of the biblical story. I talked about how it's really important for us to find our place in God's purposes, to see what God is doing through scripture, how that brings faith to us rather than focusing just on what we're doing. So we've looked at the big picture and we landed on three principles that I think are really important. First is that we are to put our faith in God, not in ourselves or other things that we can achieve but our faith is in God alone secondly that we are called to be what I called a priestly body a priest is someone who can come to God and each of us in the new covenant now uh, having experienced the Holy Spirit we each of us can come to God directly through the blood of Jesus and we can express that as a body we all have something to contribute in community church life and the third thing I mentioned was the spiritual courage that is required as God calls us to follow Jesus in our time. So this morning we're going to, it may not be morning, maybe evening in Life Group's apologies, we're going to be looking at a biblical vision of church life. Rather than the whole big picture, we're now going to focus in on the New Testament and the very early church. And we're doing that because it's a really helpful health check. It's a really helpful provocation and it's really helpful to increase our faith. As we see what God has done before, as we see what God calls his church to be, it builds faith in us. And as I mentioned, it's going to be uh, more of a study. You're going to need your Bible. 
If you've got a paper Bible, I encourage you now to pause and get one. Um, otherwise, of course, you can look, look it up on your phone or tablet, but you're going to need the Bible. And I'm doing that on purpose, um, not because I'm just feeling lazy and can't be bothered to preach to you, but having sketched out the whole biblical picture last week, I want you now to see and read some of the words for yourself, some of the principles for church life contained in the New Testament. I want you to invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you through scripture yourself and be that priestly body that we're called to be. One reason why I'm speaking from home today is not just convenience, but because as we're going to see in these passages, church life, being followers of Jesus, is something that spills out into everywhere. It spills out into our homes. It spills out into the week. So I'm here um, in the middle of the week recording this, and actually I'm still part of God's church. I'm still trying to contribute something to God's church. And uh, I'm surrounded by my neighbours and others that I'll meet today. And God wants to fill all of my life. Church is not just about Sunday gatherings, as important as they are, it's a, or even life groups or powerhouse, it's about all of our lives. And um, what we're going to do to help us look at these principles, we're going to look firstly at some passages in the Gospels that you're going to read from Mark and Matthew, where it focuses on family life. We can often talk about um, the church as a family, but maybe don't think about what that means or where that comes from. It's not actually just a trendy idea, it is something that Jesus uh, talks about. And so you're gonna look at church as family. Secondly, we're gonna look at the radical community life that's portrayed in the book of Acts. And finally, we're going to look at some passages in 1 Corinthians that uh, give us warnings and principles for church life. And things that we need to think about as we are church together. So firstly then grab your Bibles and we'll dive straight into the first section which is thinking about this idea of family, the church as family. And the first passage is Mark chapter 3 verses 31 to 35 and I'd encourage you to pause now and read that together. That's Mark 3 31 to 35. So Jesus defines here what it means to be a spiritual family. Who is in God's family? It's those who do God's will. Those who are willing to do God's will. They are family. They are like mother and brothers and sisters. I think we could add father to that as well. Those who are disciples and followers of Jesus are part of God's family. I wonder whether you ever think in those terms. Do you think of other believers as having that closeness to you? as having almost um, that sense of not quite obligation, but sense of wanting to help them as you would want to help a brother or sister. One thing to notice in this passage that's really radical is that Jesus was talking to not just men, but women, and that those women are mentioned here as sisters and mothers. See, the Greek word mathetes, which means disciple, it, it really just means student. And it back in Jesus's time where he was in Galilee, women were not seen as students women were not really given the dignity of being learners in that sense but jesus actually says that they are and they're fully part of the family of god and there's something radical in that well before we ask a question about that i want you to look at another passage which is matthew chapter 18 verses 1 to 4 matthew 18 1 to 4 why don't you pause again and read those verses now So Jesus is teaching and speaking to people and he brings a child who's probably on the outskirts and puts them in the centre of this crowd. Now it's important to notice that Jesus's culture was quite different to ours when it came to children. It was probably much more like children should be seen and not heard. Certainly children weren't seen as learners just as women weren't. They were certainly second class in many ways. In our culture, I think this is mostly a really good thing that children are actually seen as very important and important parts of uh, of all of life. Nonetheless, Jesus brings this child who would not usually be listened to, would not normally be seen as something, someone who has something to contribute, and he puts them in the middle, an outsider, if you like. Jesus, I think, is provoking that the adults need to learn humility like this child. 
Now you might say, well, not all children have humility. No, but there is a general uh, posture in children to want to learn, to be open, to trust and to have an attitude of growth and a kind of humility. Jesus is saying you need that too. I think one of the things that I notice here and that I, I, I have noticed when I've worked with children in different situations and if you talk to children's workers in churches or even teachers or parents is that this isn't just a one-way relationship. Even in our culture where children are elevated and are looked after, which is a, br- a really important thing, we still think of it as a one-way relationship. Now, of course, there's something right that those who are older usually have something to teach those who are younger. That is true and actually a biblical principle. But when you talk to those who've worked with children, what you see is there is actually a two-way relationship going on. When we engage with children, and I think this is particularly the case in our churches, there can be a joy that we can get from them. There can be a childlike faith and trust and openness um, and sometimes even boldness and courage that we can learn from them as adults. And so the children in our church, they need not just their parents as the only model of how to be a Christian. That's pretty crushing, isn't it, for the parents? They need other Christians who are adults as well. Auntie and uncle figures, if you like, who can not just in church gatherings, but maybe in other aspects of their life, teach them what it is to follow Jesus. Particularly as children reach their teenage years, there becomes a tension, we know, don't they, with their parents. And so there need to be other adults, perhaps those slightly younger than their parents, who can model Christian faith and discipleship. For adults as well, though, it's not just a one-way relationship. We have something to learn when we're around children about what it means to follow Jesus. I talked last week quite a lot about being a priestly people, people who can all come before God and all have something to give and contribute. And we must remember that that includes everyone. So if there's anyone that we see as a, we, we might disregard or see as an outsider, no, all of those who are part of the body Christ have something to give, certainly those who are part of our local church community. Each one comes directly to God through Jesus. Each one has something to give and contribute, whatever the age, each one is valuable to the family. And just to say, I'm not arguing here for a specific model of church, but I'm arguing for a biblical principle. So I'd encourage you to pause now. You may want to have those two passages open and I'm going to give you two questions to think about in twos and threes and they'll come up on the the screen for you. The first question is about family. Now you might think about your family and think about uh, some of the challenges there. Even if your family life where you grew up was difficult, I think most of us have a sense of what family life is supposed to be like, the kind of support that families should be. And so the question is, do you see the relationships in church in that way? Do you see people, particularly those in your life group, because we can't have relationship with everyone, but do you see those in your life group, maybe even in your gathering, as brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers who you are to treat in such a way? probably for most of us there's a little bit of a provocation here and so you might want to think about how you could take an active step to live out that calling of being siblings to one another this year. The second question then is about how do you feel about having children in church? Do you believe that their presence is a nuisance to you or do you believe that their presence is something that you, that you need as I believe Jesus is saying here? Are you investing in relationships with them in any way? Of course, that's got to be done appropriately with their parents around. But I think we have a role to play in supporting their growth, to valuing them, supporting their parents, but also to building relationships so we learn from them that humility that Jesus is talking about. So take a moment in twos or threes to consider those passages and those questions that I've given you. Well, secondly, we're going to look at the radical community life we see in the New Testament, particularly at the start of Acts. So let me set the scene for you. 
Jesus has ascended into heaven and the spirit is poured out as the church gathers together, very scared, wondering what's going to happen. The spirit comes on them and it spills out into the world. And that's an important principle, isn't it? That the spirit shouldn't just be in our gatherings, but should be spilling out outside of the walls of the church. And as the spirit uh, is poured out, uh, different God-fearing people who'd gathered for Pentecost, um, some of them Jews, many God-fearers, uh, hear the news about Jesus and the resurrection and they're convicted and they begin to follow Jesus. Some go back to their own lands as God begins to send his gospel out to the nations, but some stay in Jerusalem. And a church of kinds is formed, this first early church, sometimes gathering in a large place like the temple and sometimes much smaller. And we see this sketch of what that church life looked like in this famous passage in Acts 2, verse 42 to 47. And so I would like you to pause now and read from Acts 2, verse 42 to 47. So let's notice some of the things that we're told here. We're told that these Christians, this early church, were devoted to four things. Scripture and teaching, fellowship communion and prayer scripture and teaching because they didn't have the new testament fully formed as we do not everything perhaps had been written down and certainly brought together but they had the, the stories from the apostles perhaps some things written down that jesus had said and they had the old testament and they were devoted to that they were devoted to fellowship what that means just means christian friendship loving one another being together they were devoted to taking communion Something in our tradition can sometimes be sidelined or not thought of as important as it is, but just gathering together as Jesus commands to, to remember the implications of his death and resurrection is so important. And prayer. Prayer is so important. Not just prayer on our own, but corporate prayer. How much prayer takes part in the book of Acts. It's, they're continually praying. And from this um, devotion in these four areas, something happens there's a consequence a consequence that spills out not just for their not just affecting their community life but actually the community around them there's a kind of witness an outward looking element to it miracles begin to happen and there's awe among people around among people there's a togetherness and sharing there's a a daily attendance for them um, of church meetings or the temple and i'm not calling us to do that but I think it's good to think about the daily aspect of church life and what it means to follow Jesus in all of our lives the different relationships that we might have there's a worshipful and generous and grateful attitude and they have favor with the people and there's a growth that starts to happen they become that light that was talked about a light to the nations through their devotion and the implications of their devotion so much of church and act in acts of course is not in the church meetings it's describing all of their life see luke had spoken to witnesses of jesus and the early church and he knew that the church could be like this and so he's longing for it for the next generation or two this is not about making us feel like a failure because somehow gateway doesn't live up to this it's a provocation it's a health check it's a little nudge from the Holy Spirit. So I've got two more questions for you. And I think this time, perhaps in life groups, you might want to talk about these together. So maybe stay together for these two. So your first question is to think about how do you live out your devotion for these four areas? How are you doing with that? Are there any that you're struggling with right now? And where would you love to see breakthrough? Again, there's no condemnation. This is a devotion that we're called to but all of us are on a journey of learning how to do that secondly then is there an area of the witness or consequence of this that you're provoked about that you're excited about at the start of this year that you'd love to see you and our church grow in an area perhaps that you could lead us in so why don't you take a moment to think about those questions and chat together so we've thought a little bit about church as family life. We've thought about the radical community life seen in the book of Acts briefly. And we're going to go now into uh, 1 Corinthians to think about some warnings and principles 
for how this is to function um, when we gather together and how it spills out. Let me give you a little bit of background to Paul. So many of us will know that Saul was a Pharisee who was persecuting the Church of Christ. He hated Christians and he was on his way one day to Damascus to persecute the church there to stir up trouble and uh, the risen Jesus appears to Saul who later gets called Paul and says Saul Saul why are you persecuting me <coughs> now probably that was a strange thing for him at that moment strange question because he thought well I'm not persecuting you I'm persecuting these Christians but a revelation came to Paul in that moment as Jesus confronted him that the church is so connected to Christ that it's like we are his body the church is the body of Christ and this is something that Paul lives with for the rest of his missionary uh, career if you like Christ is the head <coughs> and we so uh, yeah read 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4 to 11 so Paul talks here about how we have one spirit, the Holy Spirit, who gives different gifts to each person. The culture at the time was very uh, divided. Most people were just struggling to survive and there were those who um, had certain skills and there were those who were rulers and they were a minority and so it was a really divided culture. So when Paul talks about the same spirit being given to all, that was really radical. And he says the spirit is given to all for the building up of the church, not for one person to look better than others, but for the church to be strengthened and grow. Each of us then is called to a spirit filled relationship with God, that priestly relationship. And therefore, when we meet, God could use any of us in any of the ways that he mentions here, these spiritual gifts. So in a moment, you're going to be thinking about whether you come expecting uh, and asking God for these gifts for others. But before we do, I want you to read the next part, which is uh, 1 Corinthians 12 verses 12 to 24. So pause now and read verses 12 to 24 together. In this section, Paul challenges two tendencies that we could have. A tendency to discount ourselves, to come to uh, church or to be with other Christians, perhaps even to be um, out on the street with a, a, a non-Christian or with someone else at work or in your neighbourhood and say, well, I'm not like so-and-so. I'm not like them. I don't have that gift. I could never be used by God. But Paul challenges that. He says, don't discount yourself. You're a member of the body. You have the same spirit. God could use you in that way. The other challenge is the opposite. We could look at someone else, particularly in our local church community in Gateway, and say, well, because of their age or their skills or something about them, well, they've got nothing to teach me. And again, he says, no, they have the same spirit. God could speak to you through them and build up his church and do significant things. So I want you to have a think together then about perhaps in twos and threes again, as a place to be really honest, two questions. Firstly, which of those is your tendency? Do you tend to discount yourself from being used to bring a spiritual contribution? Do you think, well, I'm just a practical person? That doesn't seem to be what's being said here. You are a spiritual person. You have the Holy Spirit. So do you discount yourself or do you tend to discount others? And secondly, do you come to church gatherings asking God for a contribution? Asking God to speak to you for an individual or person there? Not all of us will always want to speak out the front, but there are ways of sharing things and there are individuals that we could all speak to. Are you stepping out? Take a moment to think about those two questions. And we're gonna finish with our last passage, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'd love you to pause now and read. It's a really short chapter, the whole of 1 Corinthians 13. It may be the first time you've ever read this in context, read it together. So 1 Corinthians 13 is great that it's read at weddings and you may have heard it lots of times, but I think it's important to remember the context is communal church life. The context is the gathered church and what that's supposed to be like. 
Paul, in, here, in this context of spiritual gifts in the chapter before, is giving a bit of a warning. He's saying, let's be careful. Spiritual gifts are really important. Let's be careful we don't use them for showing off. They need to be about love, about building up the church. Without love, it's meaningless. And Paul describes here true Christian love for all relationships, not just for marriage, but for friendships, for church life. And Paul does point out that, in a sense, spiritual gifts are temporary because they help us to know God's love in this life. But when we know God fully, when Christ returns and uh, we come face to face with God in some sense, we will know God fully. And so we won't need him. And so love is more permanent. Love is the priority. Love is the most important. But Paul does go on to say, but do eagerly desire them. And so there's a tension there. But we can learn here about Christian love. And so I'd love for you to take the last few moments to focus particularly on verses 4 to 7. That description of Christian love in the church community that's going to spill out into the world. As you reread these few verses, what challenges you most? What challenges you here? What does the Holy Spirit speak to you? Remember, the Spirit is speaking to you about how to express love in the church and in the world. I'd love you to be honest and to take a few moments to think about that. Again, there's no condemnation. There is a Spirit, Holy Spirit nudge. Ask that the Holy Spirit would fill you so that you uh, could share the true love that is described here. Take some moments to pray together. That's our last question. So I hope this has been um, really helpful for you and that God would really bless you this week as you uh, try to live out your calling to Christ as you're filled with the Spirit this week. God bless. Bye. 